Greetings, folks. How are you all doing? Oh, look at this. Have a look at this. This is the Anderson tartan. The Anderson kilt. Lovely, isn't it? It's nice and bright. Nice and colourful. Yeah. Which is in stark contrast to what we're going to talk about tonight. Because got my vest, got my kilt. You guessed it. Got some whiskey as well. Put some fire water into this conversation. So, cheers. Mm. I know what in the last video I mentioned, I'm going to talk about zombies uh, very soon. And I will be, I will be. Got some big stuff coming your way. Uh, but tonight, I'm going to talk about vampires. But really nasty ones. We're not talking your suave Count Dracula here. We're not talking those pretty boys from Twilight. Oh, no, 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 no. We're talking fucking nasty big fanged brutes that just shred their victims and devour them, toy with them, taunt them, butcher them. Oh, no. 30 Days of Night. Based on a graphic novel, very successful graphic novel, and brought to the screen in 2007 by director David Slade, starring Melissa George, gorgeous Melissa George, and Josh Hartnett. And these two are, he's the sheriff, she's the fire marshal. They are man and wife, but they're going through a bit of trouble at the time. And we're set up in the USA's most northern town ever. You know, we're up in Barrow, Alaska. Oh my God, the top of the world. And, but, well, once a year, for 30 days, the sun disappears. It's gone. It's all the way gone. So, whoever remains in town, and not everyone does, you know, it's a thriving community, but a lot of people can't take that kind of, you know, eternal darkness. So they kind of split and vamoose down to the likes of Seattle. Is that any better, really? So, only a few people are left in the town. But enough, enough for vampires to feed upon and have a great big feast, you know. So, into this environment, after the last day of daylight, a stranger drifts into town, played by Ben Foster, the alarmingly good Ben Foster, and strange things begin to happen. The sled dogs are all killed, everyone's mobile phone seems to go walkies, and they're found in like a bonfire of mobile phones. The power gets cut. You know, everything everything goes wrong. And then the vampires descend and just chow down on pretty much everybody they can catch. All that's left is a few ragtag fugitives, the sheriff, his missus, and a few other select few who would hole up in the attic of this house while everyone else has been massacred and the vampires are still there. You know, they've got a they've got a month to get through. And so ends up being a cat and mouse game where the survivors we may run from one place to another, got to shift their hiding places, got to find some way of surviving, some way of fighting back against this undead horde of bastards. Will they make it? Well, not everyone will. Some sacrifices must be made, yeah. And hopefully someone's going to survive until the sun finally comes up again. Well, what a movie, Jesus Christ. The vampire genre was pretty much dead and defunct, really. The whole Twilight thing and the Underworld saga had sucked the life out of vampirism. It had become stale and boring. The graphic novel was a great success. It was blood curdling, it was vicious, and the movie adaptation pretty much follows suit. I don't think there's been a nastier vampire movie than this one. This is blood curdling stuff. And it's terrifying as well. You know, I really, really love this film. It's, it came out a while ago. Hey, but I watched it last night just to get myself in the mood for you know, the zombie apocalypse which I'm about to unleash upon you guys. And uh, whoa, <laughs> started off with a good one here. Uh, you know, I've seen it many times, but I hadn't seen it for a while. And I forgot just how effective this movie really is and how terrifying it is. Ben Foster as this weird drifter who's obviously working with the vampires he goes ahead like the scout to go and like shut down this town 
and just make it easy pickings for the vampires when they turn up. And he's got this slow drawl, this kind of croaky voice. And once he gets captured by, after causing trouble in the diner, which he was going to do anyway, he gets flung in the cell and, you know, he just taunts Mr. and Mrs. Sheriff. Ah, so sweet. So don't know what's coming, do you? And, and you know, they're coming for you. And you've got, like, you know, Josh Hahn as Eben. You know, that's his name, Eben. <laughs> he says, like, hell of a day. <laughs> he goes, he goes, just you wait. <laughs> he goes, hell's a coming. And it's got big, nasty fangs. And yeah, and these vampires, they're led by um, Danny Houston. The great Danny Houston. Brilliant character actor. Um, and marvellous in the, the Aussie movie, uh, The Proposition, from a few years back. Very sadistic and violent and unpredictable. But he, look, he doesn't look sadistic in this until you get up close to him. In fact, for fans of the Pet Shop Boys, Neil Tennant, front man of Pet Shop Boys, this lead vampire called Marlow looks just like him. And it's like, that's Pet Shop Boys, how can he be afraid of that? Until he gets up close. And his eyes are actually black and his teeth are like filed down, pointy. They're all pointy. And the vampires speak in this weird ancient language. Uh, it's all like clicks and sort of, you know, throaty rasps. Like... And it's subtitled, obviously. Unless you understood what I was saying there. And I was saying there, need some more whiskey. Mm. But when they descend upon the town, Jesus Christ, they just they will just plunge through people's windows, drag them out, shred them to bits, chow down. One of the orders that Marlowe gives to his vampire brethren is like, don't turn them. You know, you've got to take the heads off. We don't want them to turn. You never find out why that's the case. You never find out the backstory of these vampires. They're all in clothes. Some of, obviously the clothes that they were wearing before they were vampirized, I would presume. So you've got office types, you've got people in shirts and jackets, and you know, they look like normal people until you get up close to them, obviously. And they've got these big mad mouths with fangs all the way across, uh, with piranhas on legs. So you never find that a backstory. There's hints, you know, they can clearly speak and understand mankind. But this, they don't want to turn anybody else. Why is it such a closed community of vampires? Why did he pick, you know, Barrow, Alaska? Why did he pick that place? Just because it's clearly, you know, isolated. They can get in there. No one can help the people. Well, you know, they've come from cities. You know, this, this mob can, you know, pretty much take out any township they want, really. But it's just a great setting, you know? And uh, like The Thing, John Carpenter is The Thing, the sense of isolation and the sense of paranoia and the sense of that freezing cold is really, really palpable. This is a film where you will just put your jacket around yourself, turn the fire up or the radiator up, snuggle down and, you know, obviously keep looking over your shoulder in case little snarly biters are coming. Or whatever. <laughs> when they descend on the town and all hell breaks loose, no one really knows what's happening, just as we're being attacked. So poor old Sheriff Evans, you know, everyone get back in your houses, lock the doors, bolt the windows and all this kind of stuff. Like, I don't know what's going on, but I'll let you know when I do. Uh, and if you, if you can't get back to your house, get to the diner. We'll, we'll all be safe in the diner. <laughs> but you see this incredible tracking shot, an overhead tracking shot looking down upon the township. And it just gradually, slowly pans across the township whilst battles, massacres, skirmishes are taking place. People are being chucked off roofs, dragged out of doors. A mob of vampires will descend on one writhing victim, blood spurting everywhere. And you just see pockets of hell taking place all the way around as this camera slowly moves. And it really is a, a very haunting, very mem memorable image of pure slaughter and carnage your blood runs cold the things these vampires do are just so barbaric it's so not what you've seen 
of, of the vampire legions beforehand. You know, Count Dracula is the model of decorum, you know, compared to these bastards. Uh, and the effects are awesome. This is one gory movie. It doesn't shy away from anything. Heads are lopped off, jugulars and throats are just torn asunder. There's a great big um, sort of snowplow or ice shredding truck which has this great big fucking serrated chainsaw blade to the front of it which powered up you know this guy drives at the vampires <laughs> and he's, he's got a shock and he's they, they're, they're all over the cab and he's blowing them off the cab and poof, leaning out the window blowing heads off but that big saw blade holy shit they're getting shredded and ripped into so these vampires can be taken down you know but then again you know if you get chopped in half what the hell are you gonna do you, you can't like stitch yourself back together again can you so yeah there's lots and lots of really blood curdling bloodthirsty carnage but it's anchored by good performances too you know you care about sheriff even and you care about his, his fire marshal missus played with real real sass and you know action girl you know bravado by melissa george and she's totally believable in the role it's nice that they, they were trying to, they had separated and she was about to leave with everybody else from Barrow and head down south, you know, for, the, for this month. And maybe they'd try and work things out when she came back or if she came back. But she has an accident on the way out there and she has to come back to town. So these two are going to have to work together. Yeah, it's an old chestnut, isn't it? You know, under duress, you know, they're, they're flung back together. Will they find love as well? Yeah. Yeah, they will. And, and the thing is, the way it, it transpires, the sacrifices have to be made. They're going to work together. They're going to team up. And they are a believable couple. And, you know, they're hard as nails when it comes down to it. So many great bits in this. They drive out, Mr. You know, Mr. and Mrs. Sheriff, drive out to find out what the hell's going on, you know, at the, uh, the cell phone uh, and radar base. But all of a sudden, like, they stop the car and they get out and have a look what's going on and she's got like binoculars and you can't see what they can see and she just goes even get back in the car get back in the car now he's going why what, what is it what is it just get back in the car now because she's seen someone coming and you just know that's got to be legions of these motherfucking bloodsuckers heading towards them get back in the car they're bombing it down this you know iced in road and one of these things jumps on the roof of it ah it's just it's wickedly entertaining and you pulse pounding stuff. You've got the rest of the characters, you've got Eben's brother as well, who's uh, in an earlier sequence, he's got some great vulnerability to him because when they get this uh, Ben Foster, this drifter who's working for the vampires and thinks, you know, as they all do, you know, as a, um, oh God, Renfield, you know, in the old Dracula stories, Renfield's always the human. The master, the master's coming. He's, he, he's promised me eternal life. Well, he's one of those, only he's far nastier. A really cynical bastard. Uh, well, then the vampires, once he's done his, his deeds, they're going to thank him. But they don't really give a shit because they don't want him either. So he's been, he's been set up, you know. But he even puts him in a cell. And this guy manages to unhinge everybody in the police station, like, including Eben's younger brother. And uh, you can see the fear on him, and he, you know, their their nan, their granny is in is in the, the police station as well, and this guy's just taunting him. Oh, you're gonna, he's coming. You know, you've got no idea what's gonna happen. That gun's not gonna do you no good. And all this, and he's getting really unhinged by it, and you can see this vulnerability. And he's a great actor. Plenty of other terrific sequences in it. You know, you've got the vampires using. A ripped up victim, a girl, a vulnerable girl, to just walk down the street. This is eternal darkness, but you've got the generators come on, and like, so you've got some illumination. And the survivors, a bit like Anne Frank hiding from the Nazis, they're up in this attic where they pulled the ladder up, and you don't know, they don't know they're there, and they're peering through little cracks in the air, slats in the window, and they can see this girl who's crying out for help, and they know because you can see the vampires moving on the rooftops that they're just using it as bait to lure them out and then because it, it's failed the vampires just then 
take their time and just slice her up and she's screaming and you know your heart's like that you know you just want to take these bastards out brilliant stuff brilliant stuff very emotive you know but supremely atmospheric as well that sense of shut-in dread and violence and threat is really really powerful and horribly uh, all-consuming complaints yeah i've got some 30 days of night pretty much that first night a hell of a lot happens the final night a hell of a lot happens but in between lots of little sporadic incidents people they, they move to get supplies they move to there they try this they try that you know they've got to get out of here you know and these things these little scenarios will take place but apart from one caption saying day seven you really haven't got a clue about the uh, the time that's elapsed and it's a bit of a mistake now because the way the film plays out you think it's just it's really been a couple of nights that they've struggled and even that would be believable the fact that it's meant to have been 30 days you like you really haven't got the sense of, of that amount of time passing you know it just doesn't seem that way uh, but you know that's end of the day <laughs> end of the day which day day one day two day nine day, day 30 who cares uh, it doesn't really matter this is a tense claustrophobic also action-packed um, horror thriller and you know it's it's a real nail biter as well the sacrifice that he has to make at the end old even or young even who he's vulnerable to he has an inhaler and even that's quite believable you know there's at one point he's done he's done a, a recce to go out somewhere and try and get some supplies or get something and by the time he gets back he's he can't breathe, you know, he, he, his inhaler's been lost, so he's got to get him a new one, he's like, uh, uh, you know, and, and they've got to keep quiet as well, vampires keep coming into wherever they are, and they've got to try and keep hidden and keep stung. There's a great sequence where they get into the, uh, the sort of the supermarket to go and, you know, restock up food, and after getting some stuff, you know, and then they hear, what's that? And they'll, they'll walk around, and then there's a little girl who's chowing down on on, the, on this carcass, probably her parents. And uh, she turns around and she's got this horrible, big fangs, shark mouth. I'm done playing with this one. Can I play with you now? And they've got to take out this girl. Oh God, you know, it's just, it's gruesomely spectacular. And as I say, the gore in it, there's a, an axe decapitation which is, we've all seen heads coming off left, right and centre. You know, it's a staple of the horror genre. But, in this film you'll see it done to a slightly different degree. Hey, you got the, you got that girl, that little girl, they've got her up against the wall like that and they try to pin her down. And that vulnerable brother of Eben manages to come up with an axe and goes, whoa, doosh, to her body drops, the head stays. <laughs> and it's just, it's, it's great, great stuff. Uh, <laughs> And then you have another bit where one of them sadly has been turned and he knows it and he's like, look, you're going to have to take me out, you know, I, I do it now because I'm, I'm on the way, I can smell your blood and all this. So he even gets the axe and starts chopping, but he hits him here, and like deep, blood goes everywhere, then again, and then again, and again, you know, because it's quite clearly not that easy to chop someone's head off, you know. And his head's hanging off like that, and it's such a, and then, it's, his head's over here somewhere, and it's, you know, brilliant, brilliant effects. Uh, and, you know, I'm a great hater of uh, CGI, especially when it's for blood effects. Now, there will there is some CGI in this on, on the go, but most, and I mean most of the, uh, the carnage is pure practical prosthetic effects. These axe chompings are just incredible to behold. And, yeah, you know. If you're the gore hound, you'll be happy with this. So, a classic of vampire yeah, destruction and mayhem. These, these are terrifying, these guys. You've seen nothing like them, honest to God. By the way, what you hear playing behind me is the soundtrack to 30 Days of Night. And a really unsettling uh, work this is as well it's not a, a spectacularly great listen on its own because it's very unhinged and very 
atonal and dissonant. But it suits the movie, without a doubt, it suits the movie. And uh, as I say, Danny Houston makes for a great villain. He has like a, a female accomplice who when he turn a UV lamp on her, because you know they figured out, well, they're biting, they've got fangs. You know, they've come out at night, they've come here because it's totally dark. Then they're vampires, so they clearly must exist. So they managed to get the UV light, and they burn this vampire chick. And she's like, rrr, rrr, writhing. And of course, you know, she knows that their fella, Marlo, is gonna have to kill her, which, which he does. He does a bit of neck guzzling, a bit of a mercy kill. Mercy kill, she's basically fucking shredded, you know, like. But, uh, but you get the sense that the, these vampires have such a backstory, such a tribal element to them, that it'd be great to explore that a bit more. And the film only tantalizingly hints at that. Like this archaic language that they speak, this teeth clacking, throat chittering. You know, I'm loving doing that, you know. I might spend the day as with one of these vampires. And I just go, oh, oh, large whiskey, Chris. <laughs> Coming up. <laughs> yeah, great stuff. And the opening shots of the of the the fjords. Well, are they fjords in Alaska? The ice flows and all this. There's this dilapidated uh, freighter, which is just crunched into the ice. And this Ben Foster drifter character has obviously got off that. And he's gonna, he turns around and does the long, slow trek towards Barrow. Presumably the vampires are already on, still on that ship. And they're gonna wait for him to go in and do his business. And then when the coast is clear, they're gonna charge into town. Literally charge into town and just lay siege to everything that's there. Gotta be honest, I don't like the um, the killing of these sled dogs, but hey, you will see my husky parading around in the background of these videos, and uh, you know, it's just, no, don't like it. I look away when that happens. But I understand why it's there, obviously. Uh, funny, I don't seem to mind the humans getting killed. Hey, you know, what do humans matter? You know, they're, just, they're just fodder. So, gotta be honest, yeah, this is a this is a great movie. It's got a few elements which are a bit clunky, but the dialogue is good. Um, the action is fabulous. The tension is palpable, and it's got a nice poetic beginning and end. You know, oh, by the way, spoilers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know it's not that old of a movie, but hey, spoilers. Start of the film, uh, you're gonna see Eben and his buddy, his deputy, and they go out to the bit to. On, on the ice to watch the sun go down and the other guy goes like oh this is where i brought sally you know the first time and even goes yeah we all did N not sally he means that everyone takes their their loved one their cherished one and they watch the sun go down for the, the last time for a month and so you get that moment and there's a great shot of josh hart on it because clearly he's creeped out they've already found i think that the phones and um, there's been some other vandalism, and he's you know he's just he's just getting this sense of unease. And the other guy turns to him, even you okay? And he just stands and looks at the sun. And Josh Harnett doesn't say anything more. It's just the look in his eyes, and it's great. It's just a it's a, a real sense of depth to his character that he's sussed on. He's got this sense of dread, and you it sounds cliched, but it really works. And then at the end of the film. Even has had to, to try and save you know, his, his missus and another little girl who are trapped underneath a car while they've all got to the great big generator place. They can set, the vampires have just set fire to the town and that's, also, that's to drive out any other survivors who are hiding around there but also to wipe out all the evidence so the town will be burnt down and all the bodies will be burnt. You know, that's, that's the plan. And Melissa George Mrs. Sheriff is trapped under this car with a little girl and the flames are all around. So they can't just go out, they can't run because the vampires will take them, they can't stay because they'll be burned. So even takes some blood from the guy that he did that big chopping on the 15,000 blows to his neck to take the head off, gets some blood out of him, some infected blood, puts it into himself 
and pretty much turns almost instantaneously. And uh, but he's still he's absolutely good guy for now. And uh, so he goes out and fights mano a mano with uh, with Marlo, mano a Marlo, you could say, with their super strength, vampiric strength, and all that. And uh, obviously, he wins the day and saves Melissa George and this other girl. I don't know the little girl's name. She just finally arrived in the last scene anyway. And because that's the last day, they go they go out to that spot to watch the sun rise, and they sit there. And it's a beautiful shot, but of course he's gonna he's gonna turn to ash and just crisp away in her arms. And you know it's not a happy ending. I've got to be honest, but uh, it's a poetic one. You know, book end the film is bookended beautifully by this the sun going down, the sun coming up, hope, and then you know. Tragedy. It's great. Great stuff. Well, folks, 30 Days of Night. Go watch it. It's awesome. Terrifying. Violent. And really, really blood curdlingly cold as well. God, I was freezing watching this bastard of a movie. <laughs> mm. So, got a lot more to come. That was a slightly short review there. I've just shaved off the half hour mark. Hey, kill man, I sound succinct, hey? Not. So, anyway, in the meantime, keep warm, keep clear of vampires, don't go to Alaska. By the way, they filmed it in New Zealand, not Alaska. New Zealand? The opposite fucking side of the planet, opposite end? It's set up here, they filmed it down there. But yeah, stay happy, keep it Celtic, keep it real. And I'll see you soon. Signing off now. Later.